Hello and a warm welcome to the CNBC Africa special in partnership with GE, coming to you live from the sidelines of the mining in Durban, which is about to kick off here in the city of Cape Town. I'm Kukule Tukele from CNBC Africa. Now, it's well documented that the African continent is rich in mineral resources, and the demand of which has led to a buoyancy in African economies. But since the significant decline in Chinese economic growth and its trajectory going forward, and the sluggish commodity price cycle that we're in, the African growth story is under pressure and potentially in jeopardy. African governments now need to implement regulatory procedures and regulation that will hopefully spur some kind of foreign direct investment, and mining companies themselves have had to opt for efficient and sustainable solutions in order to keep their companies afloat. What further is necessary from investors together with uh, private sector participants and mining uh, fraternity stakeholders? Well, that's exactly what we're going to discuss in the today's panel discussion. We'll be looking at opportunities that all these individuals can participate in at the same time whilst looking to mitigate risk. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a wonderful panel of experts joining me today who are participating in this live conversation. And I'd like to introduce from my left, or rather my far right, is that the chief executive and the uh, global president of GE. Let's repeat that again. To my right, it's Jamie Miller, Senior Vice President at GE, and Global President and Chief Executive of GE Transportation Globally, joining us as the only female on the panel today. Neil Froneman, the Chief Executive Officer of Sibanye Gold Limited. Rick Menel, who's the Chairman of Credit Suisse South Africa together with Johan de Bruyne, Managing Director at DRA Africa. Now, we are also joined by a live studio audience who will be participating in the conversation, sharing their views and opinions. They all settled in the audience and will be uh, sharing their insights with us. But you two at home can participate in the conversation by making use of the hashtag GEDebate. GE debate and your trends and uh, tweets will be monitored and uh, also posed to some of the uh, panelists here on stage. But before we go further in the conversation to really find optimism as well as opportunity, because fundamentally what we do need to acknowledge is the importance of mining in the African context and global context of things. We can't wish away extractive industries given the ex uh, extensive contribution to economic growth. But I'd like to gauge an understanding from our panelists as to where we are and truly acknowledging the potential threats that face mining on the African continent. Jamie, perhaps if we can kick off with you, getting your opening view and thoughts as to just how dire is the situation at the moment uh, before we get into the potential opportunities and pockets that we can explore. Sure, so maybe first just a little bit about GE Africa and GE Mining. Just a little context, uh, GE Africa is about three and a half billion of revenue and you know, it, it really uh, focuses across multiple sectors, oil and gas, power generation, and all the way across over into mining and locomotive power. And, you know, GE Mining in particular is, is all about bringing, you know, locomotive power, power gen sets, electrification, you know, water purification, and increasingly digital solutions to the mining sector. And, you know, while you mentioned in your opening remarks, um, you know, a lot of the different effects of, you know, oil prices, commodity prices, the China slowdown, um, really even the relative strength of the US dollar, we see that affecting you know, operations around the world in lots of different ways. But um, you know, I think for mining in particular, what we're really seeing increasingly is a big discussion around digital solutions and, mm -hmm. and how to bring technology that really improves recovery, improves efficiency, and really can improve operations um, you know, with investment in the digital side. Mm -hmm. We'll get into that opportunity in a moment. Neil, you probably face the headwinds directly, but given the recent reports, I think uh, uh, you're not sweating as uh, extensively as some of your peers might be. Well, uh, it's, it's not an easy industry. Um, we, we, we have a very solid um, gold business, um, but I think more importantly, um, as you said, Gugu, the, the extractive industries or the primary industries are, are very, very important in the African context. Um, as, a, as an example, we employ 45,000 people at the moment um, with the, the latest acquisitions. That'll go up to somewhere between 65 and 70,000 uh, people. Um, that's a huge responsibility. It's probably one of the single biggest issues facing Africa is the lack of employment. These type of companies provide um, those sort of employment opportunities. So the social <coughs> and economic compacts of that type of uh, um, is, is very important and um, we look and we are focused in South Africa. 
we would look to expand a little bit more into Africa and provide the same sort of uh, important role that we're providing in South Africa. Is the cycle that we're in the worst that you've seen it in your years of experience? It, it certainly is, but um, I, I think to some extent the industry has brought it on itself. Um, um, certainly, you know, a lot of uh, companies uh, raised a lot of debt and I think that's made the whole commodity downturn worse. We have a, so a very solid balance sheet, so we actually see opportunity at the moment. Um, we can prosper. Exactly. Rick, I'll pose the same question to you. More than 30 years in the industry, is it the worst that you've seen it? No, no, not at all. You know, there are ups and downs, and uh, what goes down comes up. Um, but, but it's a pretty bad cycle, and there's no clear short-term prospect of recovery. I just want to make three points in answer to your question. I mean, what people don't always appreciate is that mining is a long-term business, that all bodies are mined over decades and take decades to um, prepare for mining, that it's very capital intensive. So you have to, like it or not, you have to answer the questions of capital in order to establish the infrastructure and the mines themselves. And the third point is one that the, the, um, the companies don't always appreciate fully, which is the African context where resource extraction has actually been the basis of a very unfair and inequitable historical deal. And uh, as countries have become independent over the last 50 years and looked at their own interests and how to look after the, the interests of most of the people, obviously people's minds have turned to the extractive industries and how to create a fairer dispensation. And without understanding that context and that history properly, it's very difficult to, to converge and come to a common set of policies and procedures to enable these resources to be extracted most efficiently to the best benefit of the countries mm -hmm. and the people who put up the capital and the people who work in the mines. And that's the challenge that we faced uh, all over Africa and in South Africa. And if we get it right, then we can actually survive the bad times because everybody is working together to find the most efficient answers to keep mines open and build new mines. But if we get it wrong, we deter capital or we make it inefficient to mine and then mines will, will shut down and we won't get the full benefit of our resources. Getting right is hopefully what will uh, be the outcome of following today's conversation and implementation. But Johan, to come to you and get your opening view as well, uh, to what extent do you believe we've actually felt uh, the, the pinch of the slowdown in Chinese uh, uh, economic growth as well as uh, the commodity cycle that we're in? I think there's no doubt that, that the um, China influence is real. It's, it's certainly real in Africa. Um, but I'd like to get back to the point made around the, um, the commodity cycle and where we're in, in that. Um, you know, the commodity cycle is real. I think there's perhaps too much time spent in trying to figure out when is it going to turn and where is it going to go. Um, it's pretty clear that it, the one thing we do agree on is that we do not know. And I think it's going to be more important how we respond to the realities of that slowdown. I think you're going to see some real character shown. Um, in the people in this industry. We've got some spectacular people in the industry throughout. I think you've seen real success stories like Sabanya Gold during these really difficult times. Um, and I do think that, that our responsibility goes a little bit further than, um, than just the obvious. I mean, the point Rick made around um, the, the imbalances and the inequities as a result of the mining industry. We now at a time where we know that it's there's a social responsibility. You need a, a social license to operate that goes far beyond just the legislated licenses to operate because no longer can, can the people of the communities rely on governments to effectively plow back the benefits of the mining industry into those, into those regions. So I think there's an enormous amount of opportunity and responsibility around how one um, do, do more than just what is expected initially for the communities around the mine development. And there's a lot that the industry can give back. Mm. I, I want to follow up from there because uh, Rick, together with Neil, you both mentioned very important issues here. We need to get this right by seeking camaraderie. As you mentioned, your hand partnerships, uh, Jamie, looking at innovative solutions, uh, but also looking at the current environment and taking the first step in order to correct the current crisis that we're in. Does this mean that the first initial step that we need to undertake is consolidation? I'm going to address this to Neil first, then Rick to get your view, because it does seem as though that's, that's the potential answer that we're seeing as a response from many companies. Sibang is the perfect example of that. Is consolidation the first step to mitigating the ongoing risks in the uh, SA and African mining fraternity? Gugu, I, I would say consolidation is an important step, but it's not the first step. Um, I think the first step in terms of, um, of addressing the issues that both uh, 
Rick and Johan have raised is, is about modernizing the industry. Um, modernizing the industry is not about mechanization. Mechanization is a small part of modernization in our context. Um, modernization is about looking at all stakeholders, more so than just shareholders, which is what we did in the past. We were very focused on returns. We were very focused on, on shareholders. And shareholders, don't get me wrong, are a very important stakeholder. But modernization in this context is is about um, being more equitable in the way the benefits of mining flow through to stakeholders. So um, we know there's a lack of delivery. We know that um, you know, there's a lack of um, uh, even capacity within government to do some of these things. Um, we, we clearly comply with our social and labor plans, which are a very minimum. But we, we actually have to take it a step further. So, um, looking at all stakeholders, understanding what their requirements are, um, and, and it's fundamental to ensuring you can operate. There's two things that you need to, to do to run a successful mining operation. The one is you've got to have an investor-friendly climate, which uh, Rick referred to, and uh, very important. Um, long lead times, lots of capital. The other thing is you have to have a, a very smooth operating environment, which means you have to have the support of your people, you have to have the support of your communities. The rest, the regulatory uncertainty is noise. Um, you know, if you've won the hearts and minds of your people, organized labor and all the, the rhetoric that goes around with that is noise. You can operate at something that we've done, but in my mind, that is the first step. Of course, then you come to mechanization, which is where um, companies like GE can play a big role. Um, electricity is a big issue in Africa, in South Africa even. Um, you know, so th that's where you see the, the partnership starting to develop at a strategic level. Mm -hmm. Rick, maybe if we can get your insights before we come to Jamie to understand how we can implement this in the African context of things. Are we taking the correct step in uh, seeking modernization for African and South African mines? And uh, if not, why not? Um, I think uh, a lot has to do with the evolution of trust and, and common purpose. And, Certainly in South Africa, we're a very young country. We're building a new nation. We're writing the rules uh, from scratch in, in many cases. And we have to negotiate a common interest. And it takes time to do that. Um, you know, what we've done in the last few years is we've tried to chart out a program for economic development uh, and get buy-in from all the players. And that was run from the presidency of the country. And we ended up with a national development plan. Executing that's another story. But, but we have actually taken the time and effort with participants from all sectors of the society, the private sector, labor, academia, government, um, opposition political parties. And we've come up with a plan with many, many recommendations, as always, too many agendas. Um, that is a blueprint. And it's a blueprint that we can apply in mining and other sectors of the economy um, that should lead to um, a regulatory environment, an infrastructure environment, and, and a common understanding between economic um, shareholders, you know, labor and, and shareholders in running a long-term business that has ups and downs. Uh, we haven't actually started to execute the plan, but we've got a plan, and it's a very good blueprint. And because we're such a sophisticated mining economy, um, we can set a, an example to other African countries that need to build a similar convergence of interest, a similar framework and infrastructure for mining. Um, and, we, and, you know, it, it, it's on the table. We all understand the issues, but we just come from very different positions in terms of, 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 of you know, how, how the cake should be shared. So we need to deal with the distrust issue there. Uh, I think trust it? underlies it. I think at the end of the day, we've got to develop trust, as Neil says, with, with the people with whom we're working, with the workforce, mm -hmm. with the communities in which we operate, but also with our regulator, because we're a highly regulated industry. We're there for the long term, and therefore we have to obey the law completely and absolutely. Um, and the law has to be um, friendly to, to, to the industry, not, not hostile. And that's the challenge. Exactly. Jamie, let's come to you just to get some idea of uh, the, the kind of modernization, the kind of role that technology can play uh, with regard to changing the scene when it comes to mining in South Africa and on the continent. Yeah, so I, I know Neil mentioned uh, mechanization, and, and certainly we do a lot at GE around you know, purely the mechanizing, the bringing of advanced technologies to the mining sector, the transportation sector. But probably what's been increasingly more the conversation is really the digitization. And um, it's this idea that every industrial company, every, every mine is becoming far more digitized today 
than it ever was before. Um, you know, the decade, the era we're in, I think companies that are successful are going to be those that sort of develop this deep digital DNA and can really um, understand how to smartly implement that in different places. I think what we see with our customers is really two big areas where it's applicable. Um, one is really around how do you take the assets they've invested in and make them more productive, more efficient. Um, and we talk about the slowdown in CapEx, we talk about you know, sort of the cycle we're in, people are looking to get more out of the assets they have. I think the second is really the extension of that to how do you get more out of your operations itself, all the operations that surround uh, the, the various equipment. Um, you know, just some examples in both uh, transportation and mining. You know, we think about it in a couple of ways. Around our technology, our technology is increasingly getting smarter and smarter. Um, you know, our most recent locomotive that we introduced as an example um, has more than 200 sensors embedded in it. It processes more than a billion instructions per second. And what this really means is that we can start to monitor that locomotive performance as it's running, as it's real time. You know, looking at train weight and length, we can look at track grade and condition. And when you bring that to a mine, what it really means is you can um, transport with less locomotive power at more fuel efficiency than you ever could before. You know, when you bring it into a mining operation itself, you know, we see the digitization of spaces that used to be done by very seasoned um, people who relied on their own personal experience and understanding how to adjust for pH emissions, how to think about, you know, concentrate and adjust that in the operations themselves. With the implementation of sensors, control-based systems, the ability to really adjust real time and process instructions through data and algorithms, what we're really doing is helping those seasoned professionals really extend themselves across the operation in a, in a much more systematic way. But it really means that you know, recovery can go up. And we can see efficiencies really gained um, in different operations as we apply those. Mm. Uh, including the safety of mine workers, which is always Absolutely. on the agenda too. But I want to understand that the kind of technologies that are being introduced, Johan and Rick, perhaps if we can get your feedback, can we implement them in the African and South African mining context, given the fact that we know that uh, a lot of our ore bodies are further deep level, uh, some mines are open to open cast mining, uh, but th how we implement it is, is the tricky uh, part, given the different nature of the mining landscape on the continent. Johan? So, yeah, I'd like to respond to this. I think, um, obviously, the digital era and the ability that it um, gives us to innovate and to be more efficient will be applicable whether you're deep level or whether you're on surface. I don't think that really minds. I think you can apply it wherever. The ability to implement it is a function of education, though. And I think we see that, we see that throughout the mining industry. We see that throughout development, especially where we develop projects throughout Africa. Um, you find a very different um, animal, uh, excuse the pun, you, you find, if you, if you talk about um, um, an unskilled worker in South Africa versus an unskilled worker somewhere in Central Africa, they're two very different things. And the ability of the industry to uplift people and educate people will give us a greater ability to also improve efficiencies. Because at the end of the day, all of that technology can only be operated to, to a certain extent remotely. You have to have skilled people that understand it, understand the benefit, and can also implement the outputs from that. You know, convert those outputs into, well, what do we do? Because at the end of the day, you're talking about elec um, electronics that gives you information. It cannot also implement solutions. So you still need um, the skilled operator that Julie referred to that you can convert that back in. Because, you know, you, you, you mentioned in the beginning the whole concept about risk, and, and Rick mentioned the... The, the whole idea that a mining investment is a long-term investment. So as you look at investment in the mining industry, the, the, there's a reluctance when there's uncertainty about where the cycle is at, because there's a reluctance in terms of when am I going to get return on my capital, how long does it take? So all of that boils down to being able to manage and understand that risk. I guess our view is when you understand risk, you can manage it. You're reducing perceived risk into real risk by being able to convert that into to reactions and, and responding to, to that risk in a manner where you do drive the efficiencies and the improvements. So I think it is a bit of a, a combination of a number of things. Rick, obviously you need to come in here when it comes to the risk uh, mitigation element of things because we're talking about the modernization and technology that's needed, investment in skills as well. All of this needs money. How do we make sure that investors can uh, implement these particular strategies by uh, being confident that, as you mentioned, in the long term, the capital will reap some reward? 
I'll talk about money in a second. I mean, I was fortunate to be an executive chairman of a company, Avgold, that built the Target gold mine about 10 years ago, uh, which is now in Harmony Gold. And it was the first fully mechanized gold mine, deep level gold mine in South Africa. A fully mechanized means that all the rock was broken and moved by machines um, that were maintained and looked after as efficiently as we could. Um, we didn't have operators in South Africa who could do that efficiently. They, they had developed in Australia and in Canada and other places where the, the environment had led to a much more mechanized mining uh, situation. In South Africa, we went out and we looked for young people leaving school with aptitudes. Aptitudes, low risk threshold, people who didn't want to take risks, people who had uh, ability to work machines people with the right attitude, and we trained them. And within six months, using the people who had supplied the machines, people like GE, the original equipment suppliers, who set up underground workshops and made certain promises about training and making machines available, we created a highly efficient mechanized mine. We're doing it at three times the scale at the moment in gold fields at the South Deep Gold Mine. And there aren't naturally in the pipeline the skills available in many cases to do this in even South Africa, which has a more developed uh, mining economy than many other countries. But you can create those skills, and indeed you lose them, but, but the, the, those skills are available. When you come to financing, the ability to operate in that way is one of, you know, dealing with one of the major, major risks that, that, that providers of capital will, will want to put up. Um, and there are a number of risks that you have to deal with in order to get money that will sit there for 7, 10, 12 years and longer. Um, one of them is, is a risk that you can continue to own your mine as you have it today. So mineral ownership, uh, mineral rights are of critical tenure. Uh, one of them is the costs. You, know, you, you make uh, money by, by producing gold more cheaply than you sell it, or iron ore, or chrome, or nickel. And if those costs are out of your control, if power costs are going to run out without your control, somebody else is applying them, or labor costs are hardwired because you've got a collective bargaining system that doesn't provide much flexibility, um, and then something else comes in, inflationary pressures elsewhere, then, then you, you, you know, those are risks that you know, providers of capital have to really understand and be happy with. Um, but above all, you know, we, you, you know, you've got to compete for capital in companies and between countries and other countries can do it better. So you really have to be sharp and you have to be aware of what's going on in the world. Um, and those are, are the complex parts of the system that you've got to put together. And uh, again, it starts with a common interest between the regulator, the miner, and the provider of labor and, and the provider of capital. Just to keep with the trend of financing for a moment, we know that rights issues as well and trying to raise capital on the market isn't or hasn't proven to be successful for some particular platinum players in South Africa. Uh, is this, does this mean that maybe there is an opportunity for uh, private equity investors despite the debt-laden books of uh, some South African miners? I think at the moment um, there's great uncertainty about the, the, the future platinum price. Uh, Neil um, is, is leading his board into we'll some pretty brave investments that. there. <laughs> um, I, and because of those high risks, you know, the, the money that should be going in is equity money. It's risk, uh, it's, 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 it's money that is taking risk that can be lost. It's not debt money. It's very difficult to structure debt around a platinum mine at the moment because you're not quite sure whether you're going to get it back, never mind when. Those are the sorts of risks an equity investor will take at a price in order to get a high return. And as you can see, the prices of many mm. platinum assets are very low at the moment. Gold is a different story, Neil, and you must be smiling again. <laughs> Perhaps the only uh, positive story that we really see coming out of the mining fraternity for the moment. But if we could piggyback on some of the themes that have come out, which is certainly uh, capital as well as fundraising. Uh, from a mining perspective, I know that you've obviously come up with some innovative uh, solutions to the transactions that you've also dealt with. But something so critical that Rick also alluded to was managing your margins as well as costs. Uh, as Sibanya as well, you're looking to move into photovoltaic power, uh, also looking at other alternative solutions to move off the grid in South Africa. How best can mining companies implement this? And if you can, share some of the successes that Sibanya has gained. Well, I, th I think, um, first of all, um, there's a lot of very good operational experience in South Africa, and it, uh, it doesn't all just sit at Sibanya. So one of the benefits of operating here is exactly that. We have a we have a long history, a good history of mining, um, and as I alluded to, in my mind, the first step is the modernization, but I think it's also important, and perhaps before I get on to the next step, obviously running a, a mining business um, and managing those aspects um, is very, very important. And I, I, I personally think that most of the companies do that quite well. You alluded to consolidation earlier, and um, and certainly when, when we take a proposal to our board, 
we don't go and suggest that we can mine or operate better than another company. What we do is, is we take a very entrepreneurial view and through consolidation there's lots of synergies and that's why it's a very important second step um, which will help reduce costs, reduce overheads and so on. So, so there's no doubt in my mind that the South African mining industry um, can prosper, can survive a low commodity um, uh, cycle. Um, in terms of um, other aspects that have been discussed, I think the, the whole issue of technology is important, and I'm coming to answer your question in a very roundabout sort of way. But um, um, we have taken probably our top operator um, at a very senior level of the organization, and we've put him in charge of technology because we can't continue to do things the way we've done them for the last 100 years. They've worked, certainly they've worked, and they continue to work, and I'm sure, you know, if we didn't change it would be fine. But we need to do things different. The world has changed. There's lots of smart technology. You heard Jamie alluding um, to that. Um, we've made a huge impact on our safety performance in South Africa by implementing technology. We had many accidents, fatal accidents, mm -hmm. regarding mobile machinery and proximity detection and so on. Th those are the implementation of those technologies have saved many lives, have prevented many accidents and so on. So technology is, is a very important point. Now, I think the third aspect, and I suppose it is, it is technology, is there's no doubt there's a shortage of energy in South Africa. Not only that, we're an energy intensive user. We're one of the top 10 uh, energy clients of ESCOM. Um, it's our second biggest cost. It's 20% of our costs. Labor is another 55. So if we don't do something about it, you could almost say 75% of our costs are fixed. That's obviously not acceptable to shareholders when they say to you, how are you going to manage the escalating energy costs that are coming through um, from the, the, uh, the utility? Um, I don't think we would ever become completely independent to ESCOM. I'm not even sure that's the right solution. but. But certainly we've had to apply our mind in terms of um, short and medium term solutions. Um, solar power is, is clearly a, an opportunity. It's environmentally friendly, it's green. Um, in, the, in, the, in the longer term, well, we have to get into baseload energy uh, generation. And, um, and of course, um, companies like GE again are, are experts in that. We're not experts in that. We can mine well. Um, we have to do those to, to, to really start influencing our costs and again ensuring that in the longer run we are competent operators. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll come back and uh, unpack more of these issues and also finding the opportunities within the mining fraternity uh, despite the tough cycle that we're in at the moment. We'll be back right after the short ad break. Don't go anywhere. We continue the conversation and you too can use the hashtag GEDebate uh, to follow through with some of the themes. Welcome back. You're still watching the CNBC Africa special in partnership with GE, taking a look at how we can tap into the opportunities presented in the mining sector. We still are joined by our audience members who will participate in a Q&A session just in a moment. Perhaps if we can gauge if there are any questions from the audience members and we can address them now with uh, our panelists, please feel free to raise your hands and a roving mic will make its way to you. Any questions just yet or are we still shy? Okay, we'll give you a little bit more time to warm up. In just a moment, we'll get questions from the audience. But I want to delve into a critical issue that was mentioned by uh, to both Neil Johan Rick uh, with regard to potential partnerships when it comes to modernization as well as uh, controlling cost margins. This obviously alludes to something that has been echoed on the panel since the, the, the beginning of the conversation, partnerships. 
And potentially a good example of public-private partnerships has to be what we've seen in the energy sector with independent power producers. How do we translate this into the mining fraternity? Uh, 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 and Jamie, perhaps if you can take the lead on this conversation, are we seeing examples from a global scale where we're seeing increased levels of partnerships where corporations like yourself, together with the government and fellow uh, mining firms there, are, are working together uh, to implement potential solutions that do result in lower cost margins, modernize, modernization, as well as a decrease or rather increase and upliftment of the skills of the miners? You know, I think, um, you know, globally you see this question taking different forms in different places. And I think, you know, partnerships between governments, between <coughs> private stakeholders, um, really are all around the idea of just investing in sustainable economic improvement, and particularly in Africa. Um, you know, I, I'd probably talk about this in, in two respects. One is something that, you know, Neil started to discuss just before the break, which is really independent power generation and you know, really getting to points where we've invested in the scale of the technology to allow people to control their own destiny a little bit more in terms of performance and in cost. And certainly we spend a lot of time, um, you know, with customers working in those areas. The, but the other place I'd mention, and this is something that Johan started to delve into a little bit before too, is really how we partner on a local basis. And, um, you know, for example, when we um, launched last year, our production of African locomotives here in South Africa. You know, we've got a, a pretty immense depth of local partnerships around how we deliver that. And I think when we talk about creative solutions, when we talk about very local solutions that not only retain and create jobs, but, um, you know, train and create skills, I think this is a really important example. Um, you know, with our local partners, we'll be producing in South Africa about 230 locomotives over the next several years. Mm -hmm. and. Um, We've got 26 major suppliers here, more than 100 indirect suppliers. You know, and as a result, we're able to create or retain about 9,000 jobs locally. And so I think projects like this are, are really important for us to keep in front of us around, you know, how do we construct the win-win where we help people become more productive, we help the local economy and truly localize. In this example I was talking about, we're about 55% localized in terms of our content, but really help bring advanced technologies to regions or areas that need it. Mm -hmm. Johan, maybe if we can do uh, get your feedback, uh, given some examples that we do see continent-wide that are actually succeeding when it comes to these potential partnerships. As Rick alluded to, yes, we do have our challenges in South Africa, but uh, once the trust deficit is eliminated, you know, can we learn something from some of our African peers? I think we certainly can. Um, I think we need to acknowledge that the African um, market is driven to a large extent also by the production of oil, <clears throat> not, only, not only the mining industry. Um, and that has also helped upskilling people quite a bit. So there are, there are countries both on the east, east and the west coast of Africa where there's enormous skills development that's developed on the back of the, of the oil industry. At the moment, that's in a, in a far deeper slump than the, the minerals industry. So again, there's the ability to make use of those skill sets, those partnerships, um, things that have been established on the back of the oil industry that we can also use in the mining industry. So I think we need to, we need to get clever about finding the skills to, to develop them. It's, it's far too easy to say... Would we have to import them in South Africa and potentially use uh, uh, skills from Australia to uh, share and exchange their views with uh, our African workers? There is, there is value in doing that. I'm not sure Australia is the answer to everything, but um, <laughs> I think, I think we, we certainly we need to make the effort of finding the skills. It's far too easy to simply say that the skills don't exist. I believe that the skills do exist to a far greater extent than we assume. Um, one needs to make the effort to go and find those skills, and the enormous examples of that in the northern Cape of, of South Africa where um, big iron ore and manganese producers have actually made the effort of developing and finding skills and developing them, developing them in, that, in those regions, and they can locally now um, provide most of the things that were previously imported from Joburg or even from abroad. So I think that, that effort needs to be made, finding the skills and, and developing them further. They do exist. Neil, maybe if you can uh, give us uh, uh, your view on this investment on skills. Rick did allude to uh, some of the examples undertaken a few years ago, tapping into the uh, youth demographic that we have. Oh, absolutely. I have no doubt that, um, that if you approach this the right way, um, you, 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 can, you can develop those skills if they're not there. I don't think we... Um, that we necessarily need to go and, and recruit a lot of labor. I'm talking about labor now, um, outside of South Africa. Um, 
In terms of technology partners, that's a bit different. As I said, uh, you know, we, we've earmarked quite a bit of money for um, technology, um, but that's not our core business. There are companies that have, have already done it. So at a higher level, um, you know, the, the, the type of um, technology that Jamie alluded to um, can be transposed into our business. You know, in, in our metallurgical plants, um, we've got highly skilled people running those plants. Um, small changes in, in, in recoveries um, flows right through to the bottom line. So, um, you know, they, that's appropriate. Um, in terms of developing machines to operate underground, um, um, that's a bit different. Those, those are long lead items. Uh, that requires commitment from both the, the, you know, the technology company and ourselves. Um, um, but in terms of, of, of um, developing the skills, I have no doubt that uh, through, through proper programs, they're not just there. You've got to go and find them, develop them. Rick alluded to what they did at Target. I have no doubt we can do the same. I mean, I can quote an example where we bought a Canadian mine and as South Africans we went and it was in receivership. We tried to mine it. We made it even worse. We imported more South Africans into Canada and it went even worse. So, you know... You're not blaming our South African skills base, though. No, no. Well, <laughs> okay. all, all I'm saying is when you're in Rome, you do as the Romans do, but you move forward. You don't just stand in the same place. So. I do think um, a very important overlap between policy and skills is, is, is more mobility, more ability to bring in expatriates for training purposes. You know, there's a very uh, strong resistance to that in many countries because um, you know the, the people have high unemployment, and there is an, a local, you know, educated and skilled group that, that that are competing for those jobs. But in many cases, you really need to have the flexibility to bring in both soft and hard technical skills um, for a period, and we need that in South Africa. If we were to go through a boom in mining and our capital picked up dramatically and we mechanized rapidly and went into new ways of operating and started to use mega data from GE, um, we'd have to get help to build, to make that work initially. Mm. And then hopefully over a period you could indigenize all of it. But we really need to work on flexibility for, for skill transfer in and out of countries. Exactly. Yeah, we must also not underestimate the, the value that the universities can bring. So suppliers, OEMs like GE, also work very closely with universities. But you have a look at what the universities are currently doing in terms of finding innovative solutions around cleaning gas um, emissions or coal gas emissions, um, hydropower solutions, in line of pipelines, all sorts of things that with the help of companies like GE, that development is rapidly um, enhancing the ability for us to um, be more efficient and come up with solutions around sort of the core, which makes a big difference to, um, to what we can offer. To piggyback and stay with this theme regarding skills development, I don't want us just to talk about mining in isolation because it doesn't operate in isolation. Uh, and many people have always previously spoken about beneficiation as the large theme, and we know the challenges that are posed uh, with regard to that. But what about upstream developments, such as the transportation or the technology or the uh, logistic services that need to be implemented? Is this something that we're also not looking into as yet as an opportunity uh, to invest in at the moment, Rick? Jamie, you can come in a, a little bit, uh, to ensure that when that boom does come, if it does, uh, how we can uh, take uh, advanced opportunities within that regard. We're not doing enough in South Africa. I mean, in order to put that long-term investment to work, you, you need a surplus, you need um, a pool of, 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 of you know, people with very good university qualifications coming out wanting to join research efforts. Um, we struggle to fill our day-to-day -day, um, management and, and uh, needs in the country um, and, and operating in technical needs. So our surplus is not there. We need help in order to, to do that as a research and innovation. Um, we could. We, historically, you must understand South Africa represented about 40% of the world's mining industry. We were the greatest mining country in the world until the late 80s. Last year, we represented just under 4% of the world's mining industry. Um, mines from Mongolia to Chile, from Australia to, to Canada are run by South Africans who've left and have joined the worldwide mining industry as it grew in many areas, particularly during uh, the 2000s with the Chinese boom. And we didn't for a number of reasons. And, and so we are a bit depleted in terms of, 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 of research and, and, and cutting edge technical skills. We have to refill the pipeline. 
It's about bringing it back. Exactly. Well, we're going to take a short uh, moment to check with our audience if there are any questions and some feedback from the floor before we venture further with the conversation. Any questions yet or opinions or feedback from the audience members? Still shy? Shall we give you a, a few more minutes to warm up? Or I do see Peter Major, who has been known uh, to always get some feedback, but we'll give you a moment or two, Peter, before we put you on the spot. Uh, coming back to the conversation, we've touched on skills, we've touched on the modernization to get with the management of margins. Uh, but this next frontier and potential demand for our commodities. As we all know, it's too difficult to make a call on whether this is the bottoming out of the prices uh, and, and, and uh, potentially where uh, the prices will go in the short term. But if we do look for opportunities, uh, should we be focusing on particular markets where we can also find support and demand for our commodities? Some say India might be the next frontier. Johan, Neil, your views on that one? Well, I think you, you started off by asking a question around China. I think we mustn't underestimate that. I think we also need to consider what the impact of China really is and where will it, where will it hit the hardest. I'm not convinced that China will hit Africa or, or, or a slump in China will hit Africa as hard as it will hit, for instance, Australia, your example. Um, you know, Australia's got 35 odd percent of their direct exports going to China, another 24 odd percent of their indirect exports going to China. So I think, um, the impact of China will firstly hit um, the regions that primarily supply them. Africa, although there's a lot of talk about China and Africa and what they do, that's still in its infancy. Um, so the impact thereof will be, will be felt harder in, in other places would be, would be our view. Um, India, definitely an opportunity. We're we venturing into India quite boldly or bravely. Um, and there certainly is opportunity there. Um, you know, but both India and Africa are large continents with, with large numbers of people. And I think one needs to just venture the conversation a little bit beyond just the mining industry. The extractive industry absolutely is the, the base of, of the economies, but there's a lot happening around it. Um, the one thing that hasn't been mentioned here at all is water. I mean, water has a fundamental impact on the mining industry, but it also has a fundamental impact on the surrounds. And, and it's, inter, it's interconnected, you know, we can't, we cannot not apply our skills and our knowledge and our innovation and technologies also to water. And ultimately that will go to water, food, energy, all, all, all interlinked. Um, so I think really the mining industry has a bit of a responsibility on the back of the skill set that it has developed um, in engineering, technology, innovation, all of these things to take that further to, you know, to just prove, uh, so prove your point. Just to piggyback on that innovation story uh, and on the water fraternity, Jamie, is this also where uh, further innovations are coming through with regard to GE, where we're seeing this being implemented on the continent? Because we do understand that there is a, a severe impact. In South Africa, we recently experienced uh, the uh, uh, impact of a drought, which was not too pleasant, uh, and no doubt adding further strain to the mining industry. Yeah, there's um, absolutely technology investments in water, and I think you see it throughout the industry. And, you know, just... Um, taking some of the conversation we were talking about before, you know, whether it's the water at the food level, the skills level, sort of the mine level, or, or even the transport infrastructure, I think we're seeing important conversations happening really across all of those. And we were talking about skills a little bit earlier, and I think it's, you know, it's certainly not just an Africa issue. This is a global issue around how we help um, generate more interest and more investment in STEM fields, engineering fields, how we really bring um, a broader participation of, uh, a, of everybody in, in developing software and computer science skills. And you know, the work that we do, and I know all the, the companies here do, with universities throughout Africa to either develop technologies, develop technical skill sets, or really improve our access to you know, the ability to learn software and coding. You know, it's at the university level, but it also extends, frankly, down well before that. I mean, we have to really start exposing and educating our kids to all of these topics, too, so that we generate interest and generate demand and ability to uh, move into uh, the skills and the training uh, elements of it. You know, and you talked a little bit before about sort of transport infrastructure and the conversations that are happening there as well. And, you know, I think while it's easy to look at the commodity cycle and a lot of what's happening with China and, um, you know, feel really uh, gloom and doom about that, I think it's really important to emphasize that there's really important and focused conversations that are still happening at multiple levels around investment to ensure that not only can we invest for today around the capex needed and, frankly, improving the operations, but, but really so that everyone is prepared for when the turn starts 
you know, that the infrastructure is built, the transport capability is there, you know, the skills that are there uh, as needed so that we can really um, power South Africa and Africa to really, um, you know, help uh, as that investment cycle shifts. On that note, how do we build companies that will not feel the impacts of the ramifications of the commodity price cycle? I'll use an example of Barlow World, a well-known South African company uh, which provides mining equipment, but given its diversity, diversified strategy, excuse me, uh, has uh, managed somewhat to be able to withstand the storm. Neil, uh, uh, Rick? Well, I, I think you said it. Um, if, you, if you are exposed to a single commodity, you clearly have um, limits as to, to what sort of, how you can diversify your risk. You, you have a high risk exposure. Um, that, that is not driving our move into a diversified environment. Um, um, clearly we have a view of, of what commodities may be closer to a bull run, but I think as Johan said, I mean, um, I wouldn't say it's speculative, but no one really knows. Um, so, so what you've got to do, you've got to be prudent in, in your approach. You've got to make sure that uh, you know you, you, the health of your company um, is 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 good. Um, as I alluded to earlier on, balance sheet needs to be strong. Um, you need to you need to manage in the downturn. Um, in our case, we've got gold that is, is really, uh, uh, from a rand point of view, is uh, is generating a lot of cash. It's given us the opportunity to move into other commodities, but it's not really a a commodities diversification strategy. It's a, um, we're seeing opportunities when the commodity cycle in those uh, commodities changes, um, our shareholders and stakeholders will benefit a lot. Is that a polite way of saying you're bullish on platinum? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> At least we have that on record. <laughs> exactly, in the long term, precisely. Uh, just to come back to the audience, I do understand that we might have some feedback from one of our audience members, if the microphone can make its way to it. Any um, questions just yet? Okay, we've got two hands. We'll start with uh, Mr. Conditi in the front and then uh, 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 Peter in the background. Okay, Thomas Conditi with GE. Uh, a question really for maybe starting with Rick, but really the, all the panelists is, you know, the investment climate is cooler, uh, to say the least. But what are people investing in in this space? And then how important is operating efficiency in some of those investment uh, decisions? Is it, is it something that is a high priority or, uh, or is it something that uh, you know, people are really looking at exploring new spaces? Thank you very much. Mr. will get a response as the microphone makes its way to uh, Mr. Major. Would you like to respond immediately? Go ahead, um, you know, there are great waves of investment um, in, the, in the debt and equity markets, and at the moment um, they're pulling back from emerging markets and from resources <coughs> and looking at, you know, the faster growing industrialized, um, more, more you know, established economies, the larger economies like the US. So the, the weight of, of investment that has been coming to countries like Brazil and South Africa and, and, and um, you know, China and others has, 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 has shrunk. And um, as a result, you know, asset prices have gone down quite dramatically, and they reach a point where it becomes attractive to invest again. And you know, that's the cycle that we're in at the moment. I think we're still in a fairly stagnant place for mining, and certainly mining in Africa. But that's a time of real opportunity, because there are a lot of companies and enterprises that require capital um, have major capital-hungry projects that are running out. And this is the time when ownership will shift at prices that will enable it to, to trade. And that's coming up now. This is the point in the cycle where some really good projects are gonna come up for sale, where really big companies trying to prune and focus their business, reduce their costs, increase their margins, and become more visibly sustainable, can shed good assets at a decent price, where investors, uh, initially high-risk investors, private equity, but increasingly the more institutional investors will come in, um, always looking for good management, always looking for people who can operate efficiently, people who've got a good track record. So that equation is now at that point in the cycle, and that's why I think this week at Indaba will be very interesting, because we're going to start to see the first signs. When you apply that to Africa, you're really looking at all the other factors in the, in the matrix of investment decision. And that involves you know, which countries um, have a friendly investor environment, which countries um, you know, have um, the risk of uncertainty coming up ahead, and this is where a competitive country like South Africa must really play more, 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 more smart, play smart in terms of creating a predictable and, and, and supportive environment. 
Before we do that, go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Is a very critical thing. And the one, the one resultant of a, of a cyclical industry is that when the cycle is up, efficiencies tend to drop. Yep. Um, and when the cycle is down, that suddenly shows up like a sore thumb. So there is no doubt that those who are able to be more efficient will be more attractive from an investment point of view and will make more money. Um, and I think there's huge amounts of opportunity or there's huge opportunity in that whole concept as to where can we improve efficiencies? Because, you know, talking platinum, it was in the early, early 2000s. Platinum was making lots of money at, what was it, $600 an ounce? You know, um, and now we're crying because it's only 1,000. Um, you know, so it's an efficiency issue. And it's a real opportunity for suppliers of goods and services like GE because um, at this point in the cycle, people are desperate to, to, to work more efficiently and what is essentially an equipment supplying business can increasingly become a service business which, as you know, is a counter-cyclical benefit. So um, providers of, of the inputs into mining can actually engineer themselves towards being more sustainable by balancing you know, the sale of equipment with the provision of after-service care and, and maintenance data provision and all those uh, extras that make, make the industry more efficient. And that's the basis for partnerships, long-term partnerships. This is the point in the cycle when GE and the company that I sit on the board of the Weir Group can forge long-term partnerships because there's some leverage. You know, your clients really need you to do a good job and make sure that their businesses run as cheaply as possible, as you know. Perfect, thank you so much. I hope your question was responded to efficiently. Mr. Major, your question, please. Thank you. Thanks for the great breakfast. I suppose we have to answer a, ask a question to pay for the breakfast. I mean, it, it was worth it. Uh, General Electric, I can't read a magazine, see an article on TV about General Electric, and it doesn't show how their locomotives are faster, more fuel efficient, more technologically advanced than the previous ones. Everything GE does seems to be better than the year before. DRA, same story. Whatever mining magazine or project you hear that DRA is in, it's building plants faster, more efficient to extract more of the minerals that they're processing. So, and we've come to expect that in life. That's what productivity is about. The gold mines, the mining industry, especially here in this country, it hasn't gone that way. And maybe it's because of high prices. And I just want to know, can't we get our mines to do what General Electric does in DRE? Can't our mines get more efficient every year, get better? And Rick said, things have been much tougher before than they are now. And, and I agree from... 1932 to 1972, the gold price was stuck at $35, but there was inflation. So really, gold fell from 650 to 180. But South African mines got more productive. They went from 200,000 men to 400,000 men. They doubled, tripled the amount of gold produced. So for 40 years, South African mines got more productive. They innovated, they modernized, they increased productivity. A couple mines in the States did, Homestake. So those were the players that were able to improve every year. So why can't we do that again? You know, if, if gold got as low as $200 an ounce and Western Deep Levels was sinking three, four kilometer deep shafts, now gold is 1,100 an ounce. That's five times higher. So can't we find out who are the culprits that are preventing us from doing this? Can't we name them, shame them, lock them up and get this industry going? Thank you so much, Peter, for your question. I'm not too sure who's keen to respond to that. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll have a first go, Peter. Um, I, I think um, that, um, you know, all stakeholders are to blame. Um, um, I think we, to some extent, live in the past. Um, of course, what I would like to think is that uh, we are starting to have those discussions um, um, to change that, you know, um, as I alluded to, the, um, the social and economic type compacts. Um, Organised labour is a huge handbrake. Um, and, um, you know, if I have to single out anyone, I'm going to do that. Um, but having said that, uh, there, there's, there has been a lack of leadership in, in, in the industry in general. Um, um, I do think that uh, um, there are some fundamental reasons um, which are not that apparent, um, as an example, 
Um, mines have got deeper. They've, uh, there's, there's been no new investment in new mines, um, which perhaps is, is an insight of the unfriendly investor uh, nature of, of, of uh, South Africa at the moment. That has to change, but uh, we're working more remotely. Um, we're doing a lot more from a safety perspective. There's been a huge improvement in safety, which has affected productivity because we produce less with the same people, but we are now achieving North American safety standards uh, from a fatality point of view. Um, so there has been some progress, but I have to agree with you that um, we are a long way from, from being able to say that we've modernized and improved, like you referred to as GE, DRA, and, and many other examples in South Africa. But uh, those, those discussions are being held, and uh, they're not pleasant discussions. Um, and, and we have to we have to start looking forward instead of looking back. That's my my biggest assessment. Everyone looks back instead of looking forward at the moment. Rick, get to. I think Neil's given a very good answer, um, Peter. The um, the South African gold mining success that you referred to relied on very cheap labour um, and and a mining methodology that required very little skill. So you had a sort of military hierarchy underground with tens of thousands of people being marshaled into quite dangerous spaces. Um, that simply wasn't sustainable after 1990. Um, and you know, really from 1987, so there was a rapid increase in wages, but not a parallel increase in skills and productivity. And as a result, we've had to shrink the industry dramatically in order to get to the higher grade ore bodies. The attempts to mechanize it have been inhibited by the difficulty of the environment, narrow, very hard rock stopes, um, obviously, as you know. and. Um, uh, and the capital um, equation that Neil talks about, you know, I started by saying as, as constructively as I could that we're a nation under construction and we're negotiating the deal still and will do for a number of years to come. And we haven't closed the deal on mining. You know, there's still a sense that the mining companies are exploiting and need to be given a much bigger responsibility in society for development and social and economic support. Um, that they have the capacity to pay more taxes, uh, that they have a whole range of areas where they need to be tightly regulated. And all of those rules are being written and are not certain yet. And they haven't been certain for 10 years, and that's really inhibited investment. And so we have to um, um, create policy certainty, predictability, and, and trust that it will be upheld, that the deal will be kept. And we haven't done that, and it's, it's perhaps understandable that we haven't, because we're still negotiating an historical transition, a revolution, if you like. Still at the table, quite clearly. Gentlemen, from what I understand, and lady, we do have about a minute left to wrap up the show. Just very quickly, Johan, as well as Jamie, I'm going to ask you to give us very brief closing comments. How do we turn this discussion to implementation? Johan, 30 seconds. Jamie, you'll have uh, the closing uh, commentary. Be very quick. I think one, one of the very important things to realize when you're looking at Africa is that Africa is not a country. It's a continent of 53 different countries. Um, they all have different ways of doing things. They all have different cultures, different everything. Um, we need to approach Africa um, uniquely wherever we operate, and I think you need to deal with the people who understand Africa. Apologies about that. Uh, <laughs> someone not to have you in comments. <laughs> Lemon falling, but go ahead. It wasn't a tomato, at least. <laughs> so I think it's about dealing with people who understand Africa, understand the technology, and actually understand how to effectively implement that in Africa. Jamie? And I would just echo some of what we talked about just a minute ago, which is I think it, it, it's a continued focus on long-term investment. You know, and I think as you go through cycles, you can easily get very focused on the, you know, what's near and now in front of you. And I think, you know, continue to focus on the conversation around not just the sustainable economic improvement of the country, but also the long-term improvement and continuous improvement in the technologies, the skills, and, you know, really how we apply those to be more productive. And, you know, I think the good news is we see those conversations happening at multiple levels in the industries and with all of the different operators. Um, and I think that's really what it's all about. Long-term strategies as well as investment for growth, but fundamentally the cycle will change. And as we uh, have seen here on stage, here on this panel discussion, when life hands you lemons, make lemonade. And that's clearly what the mining industry is going to do in the, in, in the long term. But a big thank you to all our audience members uh, for participating in today's discussion, together with our panelists uh, for uh, giving us their views on the opportunities presented in the mining industry. To my right, Jamie Miller, Senior Vice President at GE, Global President, as well as Chief Executive of GE Transportation Globally. Neil Froneman, the Chief Executive of Sibanye Gold, Rick Menel, 
Chairman at Credit Suisse Africa, and Johan De Brain, Managing Director of DRA Africa. From myself, Kukule Tukele, and the team here in Cape Town, that's where we leave it for today. Thank you for participating in this discussion. Until next time, it's goodbye for now.